Hello, my name's Lindsay Turnbull and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of Oxford. And we're right in the middle of this very serious coronavirus crisis right now. And my students are all stuck at home and we want to keep them in touch with biology and keep them in touch with us. And so we're going to make a new series of videos and they're going to be called Back Garden Biology. So welcome to this episode of Back Garden Biology where we're once again going to look at some birds. At this time the birds of choice are going to be pigeons. And I want to start with the wood pigeon. Now the wood pigeon is very common in Britain. There are an estimated five and a half million breeding pairs. So you'll almost certainly see them in your garden if you have a garden, unless you live right in the middle of a city where you might have another kind of pigeon that we'll be coming to later. Now the wood pigeon is a very familiar sight. They can become quite tame if you feed birds and there's food around on the ground, like this one. There's also some very familiar sounds associated with the wood pigeon. So the call of the wood pigeon is very distinctive. It sounds like someone complaining about their feet. That's how my uncle described it. Someone saying, my poor feet, Betty, my poor feet. Here it is, in case you don't know what I'm talking about. The other very familiar sound of the wood pigeon is the clapping of the wings. So if you walk out into your garden and they're feeding somewhere, you might hear a noise like this. And lots of pigeons make that kind of clapping noise as they take off. And it's something to do with them being able to generate a lot of lift because they're big birds and they need to be able to rock it off vertically. All right, so those are some of the familiar sounds and sights. This is a sound that you may be a bit less keen to hear in your garden. That is the sound of a wood pigeon attacking a lilac tree in my case. So they will often sit in the top of various trees in my garden and attack the foliage. So they're just eating the mature leaves of things like lilac and plum trees and hawthorn. And you think, really? Those leaves are clearly not very nutritious. As we have seen in the World is Green episode, leaves, mature leaves, are not energy dense food. They're poor quality food. So how can a large bird, a wood pigeon, which weighs about as much as this bag of beans, about half a kilo or a standard bag of pasta, that's how much they weigh, how can they get away with eating such rubbish food? So we need to ask ourselves how a wood pigeon, which is a big bird, can survive when it only eats low quality food. Now that argument doesn't just apply to wood pigeons. So there are people in the world who don't believe that animals like this ever really existed. Now this is a model of a Brachiosaurus and that is a species of sauropod. And the sauropods were a type of dinosaur that were the largest land animals that have ever walked the earth. And they were truly gargantuan, some of them. And we know that they only ate low quality food. They just browsed on the trees of the time. And some creationists have said, well, we don't believe they exist because it's impossible to imagine that an animal that large could possibly have existed if it, all it was eating was this low quality food. So how is that possible? Well, the truth is, if you think about mammals today, the very largest mammals, things like elephants and rhinos, also eat very low quality food. So it's a general pattern that we see, and actually it does make sense. So the cells inside large animals are actually much more efficient and require less energy than the cells inside a small animal. And that's something to do with scaling. But, it's necess but it is true that small animals require much more food per unit mass than a large animal does. So actually it's only large animals that can survive on low quality food. Small animals simply can't. So a shrew can die overnight if it gets stuck in a trap and it doesn't have food there's no way that, that will happen to a large animal so it, actually it's one of the selective pressures for getting large is you can then have access to all the plentiful low quality plant food that's out there so I've got this wonderful diagram drawn by former student Pandora June and this is uh, a pigeon 
So the pigeon eats some food, it doesn't have any teeth to grind up the food first and it goes down the esophagus and into the crop and this is like a storage place where it can keep a lot of food that it eats rapidly so that it can then fly off and doesn't have to stay around on the ground for a long time. And from the crop, the food is passed into a first stomach, which has a horrible name, a proventriculus. Don't have to remember that. And that first stomach is a bit like our stomach in that it secretes hydrochloric acid and a key enzyme to help digest food. But there's also a second stomach, and that's called the gizzard. And that's really muscular. And strangely, in pigeons, it contains a lot of gravel and grit and sand that the pigeon deliberately eats. And so the food is churned up here and then it's often passed back into this stomach to get some more acid and enzymes and the food goes backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards between these two stomachs until the food is ground up and digested and then it can go down the, long, the short, uh, small intestine where the good stuff's all absorbed. Now the problem, okay, that's great for the pigeon, so it's able to digest and get nutrition out of this low quality food, but what about the nestlings? The young birds, they need proper food. They need lots of protein and lots of fat and that's not going to come from this low quality diet and so pigeons have got a really special and cool adaptation for that. So when the chicks hatch the adults stop feeding a couple of days beforehand and then both parents can regurgitate from the crop a special food called crop milk and it's basically sloughed off cells that are just full of protein and fat and they regurgitate those up and that's all the squabs which are what the young birds are called get for the first week or so of life. Life. And only after that do the adult birds start to feed a bit and start to give the young birds a bit of ground up solid food as well. And pigeon chicks grow really fast because this crop milk is so nutritious. And it's also a reason why pigeons only ever have two eggs. They never lay more than that. And that's probably because they simply couldn't manage to provide that crop milk to more than two chicks at a time. But they do have multiple broods. So it's quite different to the blue tit who just nests once and has a very large brood. They only have two chicks but they can repeat breed all the way through the year. Now during lockdown, one of my former students, Anna Dewar, noticed that a pair of woodpins were nesting in a tree just outside her, the window of her flat. And she managed to film them nesting and feeding the chicks through her binoculars with her mobile phone, which is a really great achievement. And here we have a bit of footage. You can see the adults regurgitating that crop milk to the chicks. And then the chicks growing and finally stumbling around, leaving the nest and they fledge successfully. Now wood pigeons aren't the only kind of pigeon that you might see in your garden and I'm going to go down to the town now to Oxford Town Centre to meet another kind of pigeon that we're even less well disposed towards. So I'm sitting in Bond Square in the centre of Oxford, just outside the big Westgate centre, which is a big shopping centre. It's all closed up, but there's quite a lot of people down here. And the pigeons, of course, know this is somewhere where people congregate. So there's a big group of feral pigeons here. And what you're struck by is the diversity of them. They've got lots of different plumage types and colours, and that's pretty unusual. If you imagine to be looking at a flock of house sparrows, you wouldn't see that kind of diversity. I can also see that quite a lot of them have got rings on their legs and I know then that my uh, ex-student, he was an undergraduate of mine, his name is Will Smith, who's now doing a PhD on feral pigeons and trying to understand their origins because they're all descended from a bird called the rock dove and he's going to tell us a little bit more about um, feral pigeons and the rock dove and what he's trying to do in a moment. But perhaps we can just pan out and see if we can see one of these birds. There were some just close by with some of his rings on. But yeah, it's quite interesting as well to see how people behave towards them. People sort of love and hate them. People can't resist giving them food, but I've also seen a child sort of kicking at them and that's a really common thing to see. And when you think about it, it's quite odd because people generally are well disposed towards birds and I don't think they would kick out at any other kind of bird but they seem to feel it's okay to kick pigeons so I don't quite know what that's all about. Pigeons have been really valuable to scientists for a very long time. So for example Darwin was completely fascinated by all the breeds of domestic pigeon and all of these were descended from a single type of bird called a rock dove and these usually lived in caves near to the sea and they were probably really common birds throughout Europe, Asia and North Africa but nowadays we're way more familiar with the pigeons that we see in cities and towns. These city pigeons are called feral pigeons and they're basically free-living domestic pigeons that have escaped and bred over the last few hundred years. They come in loads of different colours but most have what's called a checker pattern 
and that means that they have lots of black marks on their wings like this one here. So feral pigeons like this are really good at surviving not only in cities but also in the same habitats as their ancestors and when they meet rock doves they tend to hybridize with them and there are so many feral pigeons around that they can easily hybridize the rock doves completely out of existence and fully replace them. So this process is called extinction by hybridization and that's what I study. So Flamborough Head in Yorkshire was home to what was probably the last colony of rock doves in England and it was also probably one of the largest rock dove colonies in Europe and you can see why. It's got massive cliffs with lots of open land above and lots of small caves opening to the sea. So it's perfect rock dove habitat. Feral pigeons started to mix with rock doves there probably at the start of the last century uh, and if you visit today there are thousands of feral pigeons and no rock doves and this same thing's happened across almost all of Europe. My research is looking at the extent to which rock doves still exist in anything close to a pure form. Because the differences between rock doves and feral pigeons are quite small, we don't really know whether there are any colonies left that still represent the original form. Uh, we do know that there's a type of bird that seems to be a wild rock dove, which is found in certain places in Scotland and Ireland, and looking at plumage is sort of helpful in identifying it. So a potential rock dove, uh, this is one that I caught in a flower meadow in the Western Isles, the Outer Hebrides, it's got a big white patch on its back, two black bars on its wings, and then a general blue-grey colour. However, uh, there's lots of feral pigeons, probably about a fifth of them, uh, that have plumage that's almost identical to this. So another way of identifying wild rock doves is to study their morphology, their shape. Uh, in this photo, we have a feral pigeon on the left and a potential rock dove on the right. So first of all, the cere, that's spelled C-E-R-E, uh, and it's the white bit on the top of the beak, is larger in the feral pigeon. Secondly, the beak is much thinner in the rock dove. As well as this, the orbital ring, which is the ring of skin surrounding the eye, is pale in the feral pigeon and dark grey in the rock dove. The biggest difference, once you get your eye in, is the shape of the head itself. If you look at the rock dove, it has much more of a round forehead than the feral pigeon. And that in the field, that's really distinctive when you look at them through binoculars. Stuff like this can be really useful in exploring what type of pigeon exists in a particular location, but we really need to use morphology, plumage and genetics in combination to find out if there are any populations left that still represent the pure rock dove. So for my work I get to go to the Hebrides and the Northern Isles in Scotland and I work with citizen scientists all around these regions to collect data to help us figure out where the purest rock doves are and where exactly feral pigeons are invading. So this work will allow us to protect any pure rock dove colonies but also the process of exploring how the rock dove's gone extinct across its original range will give us a model system which is really useful in helping to understand how the process of genetic extinction works. And this is super useful because it's a process that affects lots of different species and it's a major contributing factor in the global loss of biodiversity. Well, we wish Will every success with that project. What he's hoping is that on remote Scottish islands and possibly in remote parts of Ireland, there are populations of pure rock doves still left. Uh, and he has an army of volunteers out helping him. And, and thank you very much to all of them who are taking part with that important project. Why have uh, feral pigeons ended up looking so different from their ancestors? Well, one of the reasons is that there was deliberate hybridisation. So people have been domesticating pigeons for around 5,000 years and possibly even longer. And um, as part of that process, they've also used some other species of pigeons. Although they're derived from the rock dove, there have also been some crosses, for example, with the speckled pigeon, which is a North African species. And some of that checkered plumage has come in from that species. And in addition to that, pigeon fanciers who like to specialise in different breeds and different types of, it's all the same species, but they concentrate on exaggerating particular features. And Pandora Dewan enjoyed looking at all those different types of pigeon that exist out there, the different breeds, and she's drawn us some fantastic pictures as if they were kind of Tinder profiles. So this is the frillback, which has been bred to have these extraordinary curly feathers all over its back. And this one's called the pygmy pouter and uh, it's been bred to have an enormous sort of chest full of feathers so it's an extraordinary shape and if you type in fancy pigeon into google you will find some truly extraordinary pigeons and through all that selective breeding uh, 
you know, pigeon fanciers have been able to produce an incredible array of different pigeons. Now, most of those are not going to be successful in feral flocks, which is why we don't see quite the same level of variation in the feral pigeons as we do in the fancy breeds. So perhaps it's time to re-examine our attitude to pigeons. It's absolutely clear that we humans are not very tolerant of the species that have actually been very successful in our wake. In other words, we're very sympathetic towards the species that we've kind of annihilated or we're causing enormous problems for and are becoming rare as a result of our actions. But we're rather intolerant of the species that are actually doing very well and are able to take advantage of us. So, you know, rats, we talk about pigeons being rats with wings. And that's a really unfair characterization. Uh, they are just species that have been able to be successful around humans and perhaps we should learn to tolerate them a little bit more. I mean especially as a gardener pigeons don't really do a lot of damage in your garden. It's true if you're growing brassicas then you definitely need to put a net over them um, but otherwise they're relatively innocuous really. So I would just urge you to think you know stop the pigeon? Never. Till next time goodbye.